Hello and welcome to St. Mary's Magdalene Church here in Goldcliffe. It's really good that we are here in Goldcliffe on this particular Sunday because earlier this week we celebrated the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene, the patron saint of the church here. Mary Magdalene holds a unique place amongst Jesus' followers. She was probably from Magdala by the Sea of Galilee. And she's described as being healed by Jesus before she accompanies him on his ministry. She was among the faithful women of the cross and she was the first disciple to discover the empty tomb. Indeed, she was the first person that the risen Christ chose to appear to on the first Easter day. And she was the one chosen to share the good news of Jesus' resurrection with his other disciples. Because of this, she was given the title Apostle to the Apostles. And so in our worship today, we think about the life of Mary Magdalene, about her influence on the church and the influence that she can have on our lives today. And we're going to begin our worship by singing the first of our hymns, For All the Saints Still Active. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace be with you, and keep you in the love of Christ. Father of glory, holy and eternal, look upon us now in power and mercy. May your strength overcome our weakness, your radiance transform our blindness, and your spirit draw us to that love shown and offered to us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in a few moments of stillness, let's recall the presence of the risen Christ among us as we prepare to confess our sin. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, Everything old has passed away. 
everything becomes new, that we may be put behind us all that is past. So let us call to mind our sins. Lord, in your love, you invite us to be your friends. Lord, have mercy. Lord, in your joy, you choose us to go out and to bear fruit. Christ, have mercy. Lord, in your power, you send us out to be your faithful witnesses. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought, word and deed and have failed to do what we ought to have done. We are sorry and truly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and lead us in his way to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you and set you free from sin. Strengthen you in goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As God's forgiven people, we say together the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Collect for the feast of Mary Magdalene. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son restored Mary Magdalene to health of mind and body and called her to be a witness to his resurrection, forgive our sins and heal us by your grace that we may serve you in the power of his risen life who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Song of Songs. All night long I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who conceived me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent to look over into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to the, be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel reading that we've just heard tells us something really important about Mary Magdalene, which separates her from Jesus' other followers. She stays. She remains at the tomb. She gets to the tomb, discovers that Jesus is gone, and then she heads off to tell his other disciples. And then the reading we just heard cuts out the next part where Peter and John race to the tomb, get there, look inside, see that Jesus' body is gone. They see and believe, but they don't yet understand. And in their confusion, they head back home. But Mary stays. She remains at the tomb. And as a result, she becomes the first person to meet the risen Jesus. This isn't new from her. She's also one of the few followers of Jesus who's there at the cross. When almost all the other disciples are in hiding or, or heading back in disappointment to their homes, in fear and disappointment, it's Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, um, John and a couple of others who are beside Jesus until the very end as he slowly suffocates on the cross. She's different from the others because she stays. But why does she stay? What's keeping her beside Jesus in life and in death? It's love. Upon meeting Jesus, her whole life has been changed. There's a tradition that, that casts Mary Magdalene in the role of a prostitute before she meets Jesus. But there's little evidence to support that view. What we do know is that Luke records in chapter 8 of his gospel account that she had had seven demons driven out of her and now supported Jesus out of her own resources along with a few other women, which seems to imply that she's reasonably wealthy. Meeting Jesus seems to have turned her life on its head, or should that rather be turned it, it back onto its feet. Her whole life refocuses and recenters around Jesus. She lives out in her life the words we heard from Song of Songs. Seeking Jesus wholeheartedly, not content until she finds him, until she's beside him once more. She loves him more than anything else in the world. 
She's all in, both feet firmly in Jesus' camp, seemingly right from the start. Most of the other disciples we see, they mess up, they get things wrong. And they spend most of their time one foot in, one foot out. Some even right up until Pentecost. They're not quite ready to risk everything. Now again, there have been some including most recently Dan Brown in his Da Vinci Code series, who attempted to portray this love, this dedicated all-or-nothing love, as romantic or, or sexual in nature. Not only does this idea have zero supporting evidence in the early Christian writings and other writings, it also creates a real problem for us if that's how we want to view it, if that's how we decide we want to read the passages where she appears. Firstly, it feeds into our cultural obsession with marriage. The world around us sees marriage as this great fundamental right. And as Christians, we see marriage as a great good, a God-given union. And indeed, one of the great pains of the current pandemic is, is having to ring people and tell them we can't marry them yet. But if we put it on a pedestal, even perhaps wanting to insist that Jesus might have been married, well, we undermine a large swathe of the New Testament. Marriage is a wonderful thing. I happen to be very happily married to Katie, so I can attest that, that marriage is a great God-given gift. But singleness is a great God-given gift too. I'm sure it hasn't escaped anyone's attention that Jeremy is single. He's not married. Marriage and singleness aren't competing ideals. They aren't in a hierarchy with one being better than the other. Instead, they witness to Christ in different ways, what it is to follow him. They each give us a window into what it is to follow Christ. If we toy with the idea that perhaps Jesus was married, is it betraying some underlying assumption in us that Jesus couldn't possibly have lived life to the full without his spouse, that he couldn't have lived a full and joyful life single, that to be complete, he had to be married? The second problem that this idea that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were married creates is that it makes their relationship an exclusive one. A relationship which only the two of them shared, beautiful, unique, and special, but in no way applicable to us. But Jesus, time and time again, invites us to have that relationship with him for ourselves. Mary Magdalene models for us how we're to wholeheartedly and single-mindedly love and pursue Jesus. We too are called to live out those words from Song of Songs. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that marriage and singleness um, each give us a window into what it is to follow Jesus. I want to just briefly expand on that. Marriage witnesses the relationship of Christ to his church. In marriage, we're meant to see a picture of Jesus and us, his people, a relationship of, of self-sacrifice and devotion. It's a, it's a high calling. Singleness witnesses to a wholehearted devotion to and, and reliance on Jesus, finding our needs and desires satisfied in him, a life fully dedicated to him. That's a high calling. But do you see what they both have in common? They both witness to our shared calling, whether married or single, to give ourselves fully to Jesus. They both witness to the fact that only in Christ will we find our true joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. In Life Explored these last six weeks, we've been exploring the, the idols that distract us from God, the, the little gods that we pour our time and effort and money into, hoping that they'll satisfy. And there are all sorts of things we can do that with, career, popularity, relationships, money. 
And in our normal lives, there are so many distractions around us that promise us so much if we give them their all, but in reality return so little. One of the results, perhaps even benefits, dare I say it, of the current pandemic is that many of these things have been stripped away. Our lives have become much more simpler, much more stark, stripped back of all the things that keep us distracted. And I know that a number of those who I've been keeping in contact with have, during this time, um, allowed this to refocus them on Jesus, recenter their lives around him. They found themselves rediscovering or, or discovering for the first time, go, going deeper in their prayer lives, in, in their scripture reading, in their relationship with God. The slowdown has allowed them to put Jesus back in his rightful place at the centre of their lives. But as lockdown eases, as things start to return to some semblance of normality, or indeed the new normal, as it's being called, we're at risk of going back to how things were before, of slipping back into old patterns and habits. As the things that have been stripped away return, will we allow them to crowd Jesus out and move him back into the peripheral of our lives? Thanks for getting me through the crisis, Jesus. I'll be in touch. Or have we discovered something truly precious that we want to keep? Something that, that we'll chase after and defend from all the other demands on our time and our attention? Have we, like Mary Magdalene, discovered a relationship that truly satisfies, which brings life, which meets us in our deepest needs? But perhaps that's not you. Perhaps lockdown has resulted in even more demands on your time, an even more hectic schedule. Or perhaps the slowdown does mean you've had more free time, but you've spent it binging Netflix, sorting out the shed, or, or tackling that wilderness of a garden. None of these things are bad things. Netflix has some wonderful shows and films on it. The shed probably did need a sort out. And God calls us to care for creation. So caring for our small part of it, it is a wonderful thing. They're good things, but they're not the good thing. In my first year of training at St. Padans, we were split into groups um, who on a rotated basis would lead worship in chapel. And in the first term, um, during one of my group's weeks, um, we were asked to lead worship in the chapel. And one of my friends volunteered to lead all age worship. And they decided that they'd theme their all age worship around putting Jesus back at the center of our lives. Now, this person who, who shall remain anonymous for their own protection, they loved their motorbike. They loved going through rides through the countryside. They loved going off on adventures on it. And for this service, they moved the altar back against the wall and put their motorbike in its place, hidden with screens. And partway through the worship, they revealed the bike, making the point that it could be so easy for them to put that at the center of their lives rather than Jesus. Well, that all-age worship sent furious ripples through the community. People of all traditions, conservative and liberal, evangelical and Catholic, couldn't believe that this outrageous thing had happened, putting his motorbike where the altar should have been. Perhaps right now you feel the heckles on your neck rising, some sort of rage brewing in yourself. What everyone missed was that the point had been made perfectly. We're outraged when we find something in the place God should be. If you came back to church and found that we'd rearranged it all and put something else where the altar was meant to be, you may well be outraged. But do we have the same reaction 
when we place other things in our lives where God should be in our lives? Do we feel that same sense of discomfort and unease when things crowd God out of the central place in our lives? Does does it even bother us? Do we, in examining our lives, notice that that things like relationships or TV or money or or success have, have stopped us pursuing Jesus, have pushed him to one side? Does that make us want to change? Does that make us want to put things right? Or do we think that's fine? These things are good things. Jesus won't mind. After all, Jesus, well, he loves us, doesn't he? He'll understand. But Jesus is the one who says, if we love him, we'll do as he commands. He's the one who says that whoever puts their hand to the plough, in other words, starts following him and looks back, isn't worthy of him. Jesus rightfully demands the central place in our lives. If you've got this far through the pandemic and haven't rediscovered or indeed discovered for the first time that joy of knowing Jesus, may I encourage you now as lockdown eases to take stock, to use this time to to reevaluate your life and your priorities. What will you leave behind as lockdown eases? What, What has to get out the way that Jesus can come more centrally into your life? The wonderful thing about Jesus is that he doesn't crowd out any of that other stuff in our lives. Instead, that stuff finds their rightful place. Jesus at the center sort of brings everything else into a harmonious orbit around him. He's the only one who can truly hold our lives together. Now is not the time for one foot in, one foot out following. Feels really risky to go both feet in. After all, then we have something to lose. It may cost us. But Jesus promises us that in following him, in giving ourselves in wholehearted devotion to him, we find life in all its fullness. He presents us with the paradox that those who lose their lives in following him will find life Life in all its fullness in him. In Mary Magdalene, we have the picture of someone who who loves Jesus above all else, who single-mindedly pursues him. Where that leads her to crowded streets with people eager to hear his teaching, thirsty for the word, or, or to his crucifixion and death or to the empty tomb and, and, and despair, or even to risen life and insurmountable joy. She follows him wherever he goes, because in him she has found the one who can truly satisfy, the one who's the very source of life itself, the one who will never let her down. May the Holy Spirit stir up in each one of us that same longing that we chase after Jesus wherever he leads us, knowing that in him we find true life. And then at the last, with Mary Magdalene, we see the risen Saviour for ourselves and rejoice with him for eternity. Amen. So let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, 
By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, your Son said of the woman who is a sinner, her many sins are forgiven because she has loved much. Forgive the sins of all who love you and strengthen your church to show forth your love in today's world. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Many women ministered to the needs of your Son on his saving journeys. Open our eyes to see you in those in need or sickness. We call to mind those known to us who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. The situations we have seen on the news. Lord, as we hold these people before you, meet them in their need. Move us by your Spirit to be your hands and feet in whatever ways we can. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Mary Magdalene was the first to greet your risen Son and carried the news of his triumph over death to the disciples. Strengthen us to be faithful witnesses to the gospel in the world and grant your grace to all who preach and teach the faith. We pray particularly for Jeremy, for Hilary and Alan and for our Bishop Cherry. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Your Son called those who do your will, his brother and sister and mother. And so we pray for your church throughout the world, particularly for the Mega ministry area and the Caldicott ministry area. Teach us to live as members of one family, united in faith and love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We thank you for those who have come before us in the faith. And remember before you those who have died, particularly the recently departed. We pray for those who mourn, that they may know your comfort and your peace. Grant that with Mary Magdalene and all your saints, we may, when our time comes, see your Son face to face in everlasting glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. God is love, and those who love live in God, and God lives in them. So the peace of the Lord be with you always.
We now sing our offertory hymn, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsteth after you. God of light and health, in your Son, Jesus Christ, we find forgiveness of all that is past. Grant that in this Eucharist today, we may find healing of our sins. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We celebrate together the gifts and the grace of God. We take this bread, we take this wine, to follow Christ's example and obey his command. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. True and living God, the source of life for all creation, you made us in your own image. Always and everywhere we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Today we thank you for Mary Magdalene who followed Christ in love was the first to announce to his apostles that he'd risen from the dead. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we praise your glorious name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, almighty God, because on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come in glory. Therefore, loving God, recall in now the sacrifice of Christ your Son, once for all upon the cross, and the triumph of his resurrection. We ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that we may be fed with the body and the blood of your Son, and be filled with your life and goodness. Unite us in Christ and give us your peace, that we may do your work and be his body in the world. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, we boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. For though we are many, we are one body, we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, give us your peace. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. body of Christ, the bread of life. The blood of Christ, the fruit of the vine. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, for his love is everlasting. Generous God, you have fed us at your heavenly table. Kindle us with the fire of your spirit, that when the Lord comes again, we may shine as lights before him, who is alive and reigns in glory forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Christ, who makes saints of sinners, who has transformed those we remember today, raise and strengthen you, that you may transform the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
servants, faithful, true, and bold. Strive for thy kingdom as the saints of old, and win with them the glorious crown of gold. Triumphant, rising brighter.